Hello everyone! It is a gorgeous Saturday and we've got a low tide so I thought I would give you a tour of my personal favorite beach. Not, maybe not favorite, my closest beach, the beach I visit the most often. Uh, this is the Pretty Sand Spit. It is this long peninsula that sticks out that has now become the main access for the Key Peninsula Highway. And we've got a negative two foot tide coming up. And so I wanted to get out here and take a look and see how the sea creatures are faring after last week's super hot temperatures. So I'm expecting we'll see some recently dead sand dollars, probably some uh, heart cockles that may have perished. Um, the soft-bodied animals, it'll be hard to tell <laughs> because they don't really leave much of a skeleton behind, but we've got an awesome low tide, so um, if you want to pop into the comments where you're watching from, that's always fun for us to know. We like to see just how far our message of stewardship is traveling. Already, I'm not very far down the beach, I just parked right up there. Um, seeing in the awesome sight of some folks who are picking up fireworks trash. That is just such an important thing to do here because this peninsula is rather wave swept and wind swept. You can probably hear that wind noise a little bit. It tends to accumulate trash and human debris. So um, it's awesome to see folks out here picking up after the 4th of July festivities. Um, but you can see, I don't have to go very far before I can see lots of interesting sea life. First thing I notice is I'm already in an eelgrass bed. Um, eelgrass is a true plant compared to this algae. We've got two different kinds here. This is Ulva lactuca, and it forms these sheets. And then there's Ulva intestinalis, which you can guess why it got its name, forms these kind of long, skinny, hollow tubes. Um, but the eelgrass is actually a plant, so it's got roots, stems, leaves, flowers, and seeds even. Um, and this is the non-native species that introduced uh, Japanese eelgrass, Sostra japonica. Um, we also will get, hopefully, to see some of our native eelgrass, and you'll, you'll be able to see the difference. Um, the the non-native eelgrass is very, very thin, um, where our native eelgrass is very thick. Ooh, here's something interesting. A little pile of something, my guess would be eggs of some kind of worm beneath the surface. Really hard to tell unless I had a microscope and I did not bring a microscope with me today. There should be plenty to see without a microscope. Um, so yeah, let's just walk along. If you have questions, you can post them in the comments, but I have to admit, I'm not very great at reading and walking and talking all at the same time. So I'll do my best. Um, so here in this little kind of puddle, this acts as like a little oasis for some sea life. And so sometimes we'll see, um, oh, here's some native eelgrass. So growing right next to the non-native, we've got a patch of our native eelgrass, Zostra marina. Um, and you can see how thick the blades are on the native eelgrass compared to how thin they are on the introduced species. That's just a good, nice comparison there. Uh, I'm already noticing several crab carcasses. The gulls have been out and are on patrol looking for, in particular, freshly molted crabs. Um, that they can make an easy meal out of. Here we've got a sand dollar, an upside down one. We'll give this one a little flip oh, and a little shore crab or two hiding underneath it. Um, so this species is dark when it's alive and you'll start to notice it sparkles a little bit as it moves those spines. The spines are controlled by just the thinnest, tiniest little muscles along the outside of their, their skeleton called a test. Um, I can show you some sand dollar tests here in a second. There's actually a huge, huge bed of sand dollars here. So we'll leave that one right side up. Oh, look, look, look. You have to have really good eyes to spot this shrimp here. This is called a Krangen shrimp. Um, and they are incredible at camouflaging. They take on that really sandy characteristic um, coloring kind of 
gray with little splotches and they're really good at hiding. Um, then also speaking of hiding, there's a tiny little graceful crab here who saw me and decided to throw up those claws, acting crabby, and then was about to bury and then said, no, nah, I think I'm gonna just make a run for it. Oh, you're gonna find a better spot to bury. Showing off their really great adaptations for living life in this intertidal zone. Their face, where all of their sensory organs are and their mouth parts and their eyes are, is right up at the edge of their carapace. So when they bury themselves, using that kind of forward backwards motion, using all their legs and then their big pinchers to really push them in, they can bury themselves fully, but leave all of their kind of their face exposed. Pretty cool, pretty cool trick to help them survive down here. Okay, so here's a dead sand dollar and we're gonna see lots more dead sand dollars here um, in a second. Okay, so here's a dead crab. A very, very stinky dead crab. Don't touch it. <laughs> We're gonna have that low tide smell on you for a while. Oh, there goes a heron. Great blue herons love this shallow section of a beach um, where the eelgrass meadows are because they can just wade in and hunt. And the Harbor Wild Watch logo is a heron. So when I'm walking through the water, kind of stalking my prey, so to speak, um, I'm always reminded of that, that heron. So here's what sand dollars look like when they're doing their sand dollar thing. <laughs> they're all almost always kind of tipped on edge like this. And this is because they use those spines that this one is just wiggling so beautifully for us. Wave hello to everyone. They, they use those spines to kind of pull plankton down to their mouth, which is in the center. Um, so on a, on a dead sand dollar, this one is a long dead specimen. Um, the mouth is in the center. They have these kind of oral grooves that all lead into the mouth. They also have an anus down here at the bottom, um, which is interesting because sand dollars all go to the bathroom at the same time. Um, so they will coordinate that. They poop on the outgoing tide and feed on the incoming tide. Oh, and then here's just the weirdest thing too. So sand dollars, they don't have a central nervous system. So even broken ones don't necessarily know that they're dead. So this one's been broken up. There's pieces of it um, kind of all around here. And they're all moving. They are like little zombies. They don't know when they're dead. So this one's still moving, sparkling. All the individual cells will continue to function until they basically run out of energy because they're not being nourished by the creature because um, it's been crushed. Sorry, dude. You're still very cool though. Um, but I'm entering now the space where there are tons of sand dollars and it might not look like it because most of them are buried under, but where you see these kind of little ridges in the sand, like that's a sand dollar right there. And there's another one there and there's another one here and another one here. They all kind of stack together. Oh, the sheriff's going by. Ooh, and a cool whale kite down there. Nice. Um, but they'll, they'll all stack together like that. And sometimes you won't know that you're in a sand dollar bed until you're in the middle of the sand dollar bed. So this whole swath of beach right here is just filled with sand dollars. And this is what I was really worried about during the heat wave. Um, I couldn't really bring myself to come down and check it out. I did not want to witness the carnage in action. Plus it was 110 degrees, which is a little hot for my liking, but I am seeing lots of recently dead sand dollars that are not broken. So because it still kind of has that gray coloration, I can tell that this one probably died during the heat wave. Um, these two, this one's still alive. We'll give it a flip. The waves sometimes knock them over and the waves also sometimes knock them back. Um, so yeah, so here's a few more recently deceased ones look at all these just burying here together doing their sand dollar thing i always say it's a good thing they're not actually worth a dollar or they'd be extinct because there are so many of them here look at them like all this sand would be smooth if it weren't for these animals all living here just stacked up just the sparkle is so beautiful 
and they can move. Let's kind of see this one moving. They're not very fast because their little legs are just so tiny, their spines, but they can move. All right, let's, let's get around this sand dollar bed. Usually I can walk a little bit deeper. If I do um, have to cross a sand dollar bed, what you wanna do is you want to avoid stepping on any obvious ones. So I'm not gonna put my foot there because there's an obvious sand dollar there. I know there are sand dollars here, but I could step here and the, um, the sand would disperse my weight pretty well. So if you can find a spot where there's no edges of sand dollars sticking up, that's a good place to walk, or you can walk on the dead skeletons. So if it's obviously dead, it's dark, or it's brown like this, you could crunch on that, and that'll absorb your weight. Um, nothing really uses sand dollar shells as homes, but they are important to leave on the beach because they contain the raw material that the rest of the sand dollars, the new larval ones that are swimming around out there waiting for um, their chance to settle, and be big enough to, to form a nice heavy shell to keep them in place, they need that calcium. Um, it also helps combat ocean acidification, which is where our oceans and seawater and estuaries are taking on more of the atmospheric carbon dioxide. Essentially, they're becoming more carbonated. And if you've ever been to the dentist and your dentist yells at you for drinking soda, you know carbonation is not great for calcium. Um, so like th these are made of calcium carbonate and they need that calcium to be able to form. So here, here you can see a little bit more evidence of some of that heat wave. These are all recently dead sand dollars here, which is a shame to see, but we did just see a few thousand live ones and there are even more live ones just below the surface here. Um, so by no means have they all perished, but it was definitely not easy. And it probably is just a matter of luck. The ones being at the surface, being less able to move down into the cooler temperatures, they either dried out or they simply just got cooked, um, which is so sad. if it comforts you, they don't have a brain, so they don't really know that they're suffering. Um, like we just saw, they don't even know when they're dead, so maybe that's a good thing. Uh, more eelgrass beds here. Let's go walk in the water a little bit. That's why I got my Crocs on. Um, Crocs are great beach shoes. I have some like fancy beach shoes, but I end up wearing my Crocs most of the time. Just so lightweight and nice and just perfect for the beach. I always recommend that you cover your toes at the beach um, simply because there's so many things that could easily scrape you, scratch you, poke you, pinch you. Um, so keeping your toes covered is awesome. So we're in more of the Japanese eelgrass here. Um, and I try to walk carefully around eelgrass beds um, just because they are. Sorry, I lost you there. <laughs> Hopefully you're all still with me, but we've got some really cool two worms here, bamboo two worms or uh, two tentacled two worms. Um, there are lots of them on the beach. As you look down, you can just see maybe an inch or two of their little tubes sticking up. Um, these are filter feeders, so they will stay down below during the low tide um, and then come back up. And what do we have here? There's a bit of a raised spot. I don't think it's a moon snail, but then again, what else would lift the sand up like this? I think maybe it is a moon snail. So let's go in for a little, oh, a little closer inspection. And yes, it is a moon snail <laughs> digging up this eelgrass. So this gives us a good view of the roots and the stems of the eelgrass. Um, but there's a big snail hidden right down here. Um, so I can carefully move some of that sand away so you can see this animal. This is a big one. Wow, 
No wonder that sand was mounded up so high. So this is a really big snail with a huge foot. Um, and I imagine we'll see lots of them down here today. I'm gonna leave this one buried just because I don't wanna upset the eelgrass that it's growing in. Um, so we'll kinda tuck you back in there, friend. Um, and I'm sure we'll find more that are in a little less delicate situation. This is the time of year I really like walking in the water because it's so nice and warm. Um, especially on these shallow beaches where the tide goes out slowly, the water gets pretty toasty. Um, this is a good time of year to swim if you're swimming <laughs> sort. It's uh, good. This is a good safe beach to swim. Um, of course, you always want to check with the health department and make sure there's no closures for um, things like fecal coliform in case of like a leaky septic or sewage treatment plant overrun, something like that. Um, always check and make sure that things are safe, but for right now, everything's looking good. So here we are in, a, in the change between the non-native eelgrass and moving over to the native eelgrass. Um, and it's pretty short right now because we had some pretty drastic and super low tides that has killed off some of the top portion of it, kind of like mowing the lawn. Um, and so our grass is regrowing, but because it's a grass and it grows from beneath the soil um, upwards, it's kind of a cool thing. Oh, here's a little swimming crank and shrimp. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's very well camouflaged. You can probably see the shadow easier than you can see the little shrimp. Let's talk about it. So this Kringen shrimp is super well adapted to living life here. It can swim, it can burrow. Um, it's little <laughs> body, these little swimmerettes on the bottom are modified legs that can um, burrow down. And it's trying to burrow down into my fingers. So that was cute. They're super good at camouflaging. This one's just determined, so we'll just we'll let that one carry on. Oh, I'm noticing a couple fish here. They're not gonna show up well on the camera, but those little zoomies, uh, this one looks like a, a surf perch, probably a newly born individual because they're born about the size of a dime or a nickel. Um, and this one's pretty small. So I would guess it's this year's batch of babies. Uh, surf perch are, are born alive, which is pretty cool because a lot of fish don't do that extra step. Um, they don't have like a belly button or anything. It's basically an egg, a fertilized egg that's retained inside the mother until it hatches. Um, and then if you go hang out around docks this time of year um, and you see schooling fish, if you watch for what we call the birth twerk, um, it's where the mother fish just kind of gives a very violent like shake and flings that little baby out of her. Um, and then you have this little miniature perch swimming alongside and they just school together there's not really any like parental connection once they're born oh check this out we've got a big ancient kelp crab here um, one that's looking a little worse for wear because it's been in the shell for a long time and it's missing the walking legs on one side. This is a female kelp crab. Say hi, she's waving to you. Um, so being one-legged, you can see they get called spider crabs because they have such long, long limbs on, um, normally on both sides. And then she's been in the shell a long time because of those large barnacles that are growing on the carapace there. So she is an ancient old crab, um, and that's about their maximum size. If, uh, if she lives long enough to be able to molt again and shed her outer shell, she will have little baby limbs underneath there. So they can regenerate, um, but it's kind of a lengthy energetic process to regrow those limbs. And crabs have kind of a limited number of molts. Here's a crab molt um, from a different species. This is a graceful crab. And I can tell that nobody's home by flipping it open. It also kind of has kind of a hollow look to it. 
as well as you can see the eyes are missing from those eye stalks. Um, and I could just tell because it kind of looked like it was fluid filled instead of crab filled. Um, so if you see these on the beach, um, it's not necessarily a bunch of dead crabs. Um, it's more likely that it's molts and molts mean that there are crabs that are growing, which is a good thing. Um, lots of birds down here in the intertidal zone looking for snacks, looking for some of those freshly molted crabs. When they come out of their shell, they have no protection. <gasps> Here's a baby pipe fish. This is an eelgrass fish. <laughs> you guys think I'm showing you like a pine needle that's swimming. This is a baby pipe fish, a bay pipe fish. Um, we don't have seahorses here in the Northwest. It's just a little too cold, but we do have their cousins, the pipe fish. Um, oh, what a smart little fishy hiding in the eelgrass. It just disappears. Um, this species gets about a foot long in a nice big mature one. And now I've totally lost it. <laughs> You probably watched it swim away, but I did not. Oh wait, is there another one there too? Oh, there's another one. Or it changed colors on me. So right here, it's a little bay pipe fish. Adorable. Trying to pretend you're a piece of eelgrass. It totally works. What excellent clam for Okay, so there are two. So here's one. And then the other right here. These are such a cool species to keep in captivity um, because they're very smart and they beg for food. And I just love to see them. As a part of our beach monitoring uh, community science program that Sina heads up, we do uh, beach sands. Oh, there's another one. This one in a little shallower water. So that right there is a little itty bitty pipe fish. So cute. You're gonna want to go into deeper water friend. Let's just move you one step down the road so you don't get too dried out. So we do beach stains where we run a little short maybe four foot tall net through the water and try to oh now that I'm spotting them I'm seeing them everywhere. More pipefish. All of them, teeny tiny little babies. And these are um, interesting because like seahorses, the males actually carry the eggs. So the females produce the eggs and then transfer them to the male's brood pouch on their underside. And <clears throat> the male will carry them until they're big enough and then hatches them out and then we have a bunch of little tiny babies. Oh, they're just darling. I'm really excited to see those little, little friends. All right, <laughs> look at all the gulls. So I'm sure the gulls had, once the heat subsided, had a great time feasting on all of the dead clams. Um, things like this heart cockle clam. Ooh, and. And this horse mussel are species that can live a really long time. Like this is a pretty old horse mussel, um, but in the heat got cooked and eaten. Um, I can tell it got eaten or it died in the heat because there's no obvious breakage to the shell. I mean, it may be a little bit there, but really that tells me that it died from heat instead of a seagull who would have crushed that shell had they found it. So the heart cockles are clams that sit up on the surface. You can see how they got their name heart cockle. Beautiful heart shaped shell there. So cool to see. Um, I call them the potato chip clams because they have these like ruffly ridges on them. They're just beautiful patterns. Um, but because they're not buried down in the sand they can't really escape the heat. So um, I would expect to see lots more of these um, cockles that are just fresh, clean shells. They haven't had a lot of things growing on them because they were alive up until last week. We'll flip that sand dollar back over the way it should be. But yeah, the gulls have been really taking advantage of plentiful food here. Oops. 
see. Um, looking at the shells on the beach is actually a great way to kind of gauge the biodiversity without having to dig up a bunch of clams. Like this is an interesting one. I want to say this is the European softshell clam. It has this kind of really, really thin shape to it. Um, and kind of like a sharp angle on it. I'm not positive. I don't eat shellfish, so I, I only really have to know the species that I encounter a lot. So when I come across a species that don't know that much, it just means I got to do a little Googling, um, which I love. I, I get so excited when I come across a creature that I don't recognize. That's like my favorite thing. Get to learn something. All right. Sorry for the squeaky. That's the one drawback to Crocs, is they are a little noisy when your feet are wet. <laughs> Let's see. Here's more little, little heart cockle shells. So this one has some barnacles living on it. Oops. Which just goes to show you that anything that doesn't move for long enough will get covered in barnacles. They have a larval phase where they drift around in the water and the first thing they really run into, they stick to like for their whole life. And so it could be a little tiny shell like that, or it could be your boat, or it could be a dock. Um, I've even seen them living on kelp or algae. Sometimes if they happen to settle on like the, the highest tide of the year, they'll settle in a place that's not gonna get wet again until the following year, so they won't survive that. Um, and you can kind of read the beach a little bit to figure out where the average of the high tides comes because that's where you'll find uh, the barnacles. Kind of cool. Um, this beach, because it's pretty sandy, is really a great spot to find all kinds of clams. Um, there are gooey duck clams and horse clams, those heart cockles that we saw, butter clams, um, soft shelled clams, macomas, little neck clams, like there's just so many clams and because there's so many clams we're gonna get clam predators. Um, specifically this shell that I just noticed. This is the shell of a moon snail. So it's a big big snail with a huge foot that drills holes through the shell of the clam. Um, so looking at all of these heart cockle shells, I know that there's no, I see that there's no hole drilled in them um, and they're still pretty clean. So that tells me that they, these are all recently dead, which is pretty sad, but um, this moon snail shell, they eat clams about every four days or so and they just lick using their radula, which is like a chainsaw like tongue and they'll just scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape. Um, and I'm willing to bet there are so many moon snails in here that I'm just walking right past um, because they can get down underneath the surface. We also will get things um, that look like tire or um, toilet plungers or like weird rubbery gaskets. Those are the egg colors of the moon snails. Um, and those, oh yeah, see, I see a bunch of them. Um, let's walk over there and see if I can show you a sand color. Oh, just kidding. Those are bubbles. <laughs> those little gray shapes over there I thought were moon snail collars. They were the right size and shape, but those are definitely just foam um, from the waves. Okay. Are you a clam shell? Nope. You're a mussel shell. Okay. Now I'm determined to find a either a moon snail or the egg collar. Another horse, horse mussel. Um, I didn't even really realize we had horse mussels here because um, you very rarely see them alive. They're buried down in the sand, unlike the blue mussels or California mussels, which are on the surface. All right, so here's that weird moon snail egg collar. There is a layer of sand and mucus on either side that makes up the collar, and then sandwiched between the inside and the outside is a thin layer of eggs. So it's like a, a literal egg sandwich. Anyway, so this snail, you can kind of see the shape of it right there. They extrude it out of a pore here and it kind of curls around and then the snail goes under 
uh, under the sand upside down and uses their big foot to push the collar up to the surface and then they just crawl away from it. So you can kind of see how the inner circle is the circumference of the shell and then the outer is their foot. So when you see those really big egg collars, you know it was laid by a really large snail. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's the little tide today. It's been a pleasure walking and talking with you. Um, thanks to those of you who gave us stars. That is Facebook's way to kind of monetize video creation. Um, and so we'll get that all set up so that your donations can come right to us. You can also donate to our website, Harbor Wild Watch. Dot org, or if you're really tech savvy, we have a Venmo, um, and that's just at Harbor Wild Watch. So you can, of course, contribute to us that way. We want to make it as easy as possible. Um, we are a nonprofit, and we survive off of your donations and grants. So thank you to everybody who's tuned in and watched, and um, hopefully you're able to go out and get your feet wet at the beach this weekend. We've got another nice low tide tomorrow. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Again, I'm Rachel Easton, and we'll see if we can bring you some more programming.